Hello and welcome to Surviving the Internet. It's one of the seminars that comprise part of the CS50 curriculum. Uh, my name is Esmond Kane. My name and address are on that slide deck in front of you. It's Esmond underscore Kane at harvard.edu. In my day job, I'm one of the IT security directors for HUIT, but I have to acknowledge that today I'm on an away mission, which is why I'm wearing a red shirt. This is not going to comprise anything that's attributable directly to my day job. So this is not about IT security to Harvard. This is more just personal information. This is how, when you're, these are the kind of skills that you'll acquire to try and help you harden your workstations in your environment throughout your career. Um, but nothing that I mentioned today should be applied to any of your uh, university uh, material, your servers, your workstations, um, without contacting your local IT support. And indeed, if I mention any applications or any incidents as part of this talk or discussion, it's not reporting uh, anything that I'm privileged to report. It's usually public. Uh, nor indeed should any mention of any application imply any endorsement through Harvard or indeed any condemnation. So today, why we're here, now that we're done with the disclaimer, we're here today to talk about surviving the internet. And why is it such an important topic right now? So to paraphrase Perry Hewitt, who works in the Harvard Press and Communications Office, apologize for reading this right now, she has stated, we live in an atmosphere of escalating risk, but also one of unparalleled innovation. The rapid rise of the inter internet, the cloud, and social technologies has resulted in many more people having public profiles online with indeed access to an ever-increasing array of information. And that means that everyone and their associations have never been more visible. As Harvard's digital footprint, its digital network expands, we attract a broader audience. We hope for the betterment, but sometimes we will attract some negative attention. So as a representative of Harvard, and this includes everybody watching at home, or indeed anybody here, our faculty, our students, our staff, our researchers, the risk of compromise to you and indeed to your associated network has never been higher. So often in information security, when we try to balance this risk, it's a complicated trade-off between security and the user experience. In the, era of, in the era of immediacy, we have to make thoughtful decisions about what will enhance security without a major inconvenience. We're told sometimes an ounce of prevention is worth twice the cure, but when choosing to implement security precautions to reduce your risk, we need to acknowledge that it will never reduce the potential risk to zero. So that said, we're here today to discuss some simple and not so simple security precautions that you can take right now. I should also add, uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just raise your hand. So the first topic, we're often told to pick a good password. A password is your first and best defense. It's often the only one that's available to you when you're choosing to use an online resource. But as we've seen throughout this summer, indeed the, the preceding year, we've seen attacks like LinkedIn, eHarmony, we've seen RockU, we've had a sum total of 70 million passwords and accounts compromised. And when those passwords were released into the public domain, they also comprised the password hash. So basically, these days, if somebody, uh, if somebody retrieves an account hive, they don't need to crack a password anymore. They don't need to brute force a password because they have this massive trove of released information on what people are choosing. They've already got behavioral data to mine what people tend to use. And they've broken that down to a list of about 1,000 passwords, which comprise almost 80 to 90% of the passwords that we choose in common use. So a quick example. Anybody want to hazard what you thought Bashir al-Assad used for his password when it was compromised last year? This is a gentleman who's subject to intense scrutiny. And his password was 12345. OK? so. These are, are lessons that we've learned. We need to move beyond just thinking of a password. We're told to start using a passphrase. There's a great comic from, uh, uh, or indeed uh, web comic from Randy Monroe, which goes into choosing a passphrase. He uses, I want to say, battery staple limit or something like that. You know, just, or indeed, there, there's the joke that somebody who picked um, Goofy, Nemo, Pluto, all these different characters, 
and London, because he was told to pick eight characters and a, and a, a uh, capital. But so what we learn is it's, it needs, we need to go think beyond just a password. There's a, actually a, a, an easy in, in um, Boston called Ars Technica. There was a gentleman called Dan Goodin who's done a series on uh, this changing scope of either from the attacker space where we have this massive trove available for us to either mine. We no longer need to generate stuff through rainbow tables. We have 70 million passwords. Um, but also we've had you know, a changing scape in the actual cracking space because GPU cards have made this virtually near real time. And there was a gentleman in DEF CON in August who put together 12 of these cards into a, a commodity PC. Um, he did it for about two or three grand and he was able to crack the LinkedIn trove in, in you know, near real time. It was, it was quite scary. Um, Dan Goodin's article, highly recommended if you want to go read it. Uh, the gentleman called Sha uh, Sean Gall Gallagher this morning also published a quick update on it. Uh, a lot of their work is built on um, from material available from Bruce Shire, but also from Cormac uh, Hearley from Microsoft Research. They kind of uh, stated about five, six years ago that we need to start thinking beyond passwords. The suggestions at that time were things like passphrases, gestural interfaces, that kind of stuff. You know, something you know is no longer sufficient at this point. That's one of the things I want to communicate today. If you do have to use a password, let's not be shy of stating you should, should still pick a good one. It should be hopefully something beyond 10 characters. It should vary between upper and lowercase. Uh, I would highly encourage you not to reuse passwords. I can speak to several instances where we've seen a, an account get compromised and somebody hop and skip the domino effect. They mine each account at each stage in the process for this data and then they proceed to use that data that they mined in each instance against another uh, credential source. So again, pick a good password, make it unique. You may want to think about using a password manager service. Uh, there's ones out there from, they're all in the app stores, there's ones called uh, uh, OnePass, KeepPass, LastPass. Um, it, it's a nice way for it to help you cre create unique credentials, strong credentials, but also facilitate the archiving and record keeping for you. Um, the downside to that is you need to bring that uh, password store and you need to make sure that that password manager that you're trusting is worthy of your trust as well. So make sure those guys are also using some valid uh, password mechanisms. In particular, the one I'm going to mention right now is multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication, and there's, there's several instances I'll go through shortly. It's the simple expedient of taking something you know, like your username and your password, and adding to it, you're adding another factor. So the first factor that we'll mention today are these ones on the boards. It's something you have in your possession. So that's either an application that's running on your smartphone, or indeed on your phone itself, and you might be able to receive an SMS text be aware if you travel abroad, that's not necessarily going to follow you. An application can work greater in, in that instance. Or indeed, the other factor you may want to think about is something you are. Now, this is still kind of very much skunk works. We don't see too much adoption of it. This is, you know, Mission Impossible style, um, you, you know, your, your, your vein print, your, your thumb print, your retina print. Um, those are kind of further out. They're not really very valid authentication factors. We see uh, when I talk to my security colleagues, more um, pressure that you would put on a keypad, your particular typing pattern is, is probably uh, directly on the high horizon, much more so than these other biometric identifiers. But the ones today are um, applications or SMS text, or even just a challenge response email that you're going to get um, to validate that you did in fact choose to log on at this point in time. So there's a link right there. I've mailed out the slide deck this morning. It'll be on the, the wiki. Uh, both Gmail and Google do this, Yahoo do it, PayPal have it. PayPal also have a little actual hardware key which does a rotating number, but you can also choose to use a phone number. Facebook also does a login approval, so you choose to approve it. They're also working towards more valid um, um, hard strength uh, security. Dropbox, two-step verification as well. Uh, you can also just purchase a hardware key for them. Uh, we also see in the, the Gmail one or the Google one, a lot of people are actually co-opting uh, Google's authenticator. So for instance, I use LastPass, doesn't apply any endorsement, but they can reuse uh, Google's two-step verification. So 
means I don't need to work, walk around with two applications on my phone. Um, but also research computing within Harvard are using a, an analogy to Google's two-step authentication because the, the one-time password algorithm was open source there about 10 years ago. Any questions? Okay. So another factor or consideration beyond passwords is when you're using these resources, be aware of what data you're committing to them. Just limit what you're actually putting up there. So uh, we're aware that these people who are providing a service for us on the internet, these cloud providers, they have a vested interest in you not being as secure as you potentially can. They, they tend to make available a bare minimum set of, of security, and then there's a bunch of other ones that are optional that you need to choose to opt into. The, the kind of takeaway from this talk is secure, security is a, is a, it's a shared responsibility. It's between you and the partners that you make, the alliances that you form. You need to take an active role. Choose to opt into that. You know, take the time now, make it more secure. The alternative is there's already people validating and testing these security factors against you. The more you can choose to opt into, the better prepared you are for the eventual compromise, and it is eventual. But the other factor to think about is, as I mentioned, um, these internet parties that you're trusting with your credentials, with your identity. Um, I'll give you two analogies. Larry Ellison and Mark Zuckerberg, they're both on record are s stating privacy is largely an illusion, and that the age of privacy is over. That's kind of a, a sad indictment, that we really need to wait for the government to step in to force these parties to be more secure, to introduce more legislation. Because at, when we try to work with these vendors, for instance, um, some of these, some of these uh, Dropbox-like parties, they're in the business of providing services to the consumer. They're not directly interested in having enterprise-grade security controls. The consumers voted with their wallet, and they've already accepted a minimum grade. It's time to change that thinking. So when we provide our data to these parties, we need to co-opt our existing trust mechanism. So we're social creatures by default. So why all of a sudden when we start putting the data online, do we not have access to the same protections we do personally? So when I can read your body language, when I can choose to, to network with a social circle and indeed to that circle divulge just the information that I want to. So we have access to this body language expression to vocalize. We have access to these identity proximity protections in a physical location. They're still developing online. We don't have access to them. But we're starting to see them. So we have facets in, in Facebook, for instance, like groups. We have access to things in Google Plus like circles. Absolutely use them. So the last thing you want to see is, is in this space in particular, when you go to get a job, is you've now made a lot of your personality public. And when somebody wants to, should they choose to, it might be part of company pro policy or not, certainly not part of Harvard's, but they may choose to do a Google search. And when they do so, if you provided, let's say, um, some information which you would have difficulty standing behind, you've done yourself a disservice. And indeed, as I'd mentioned, these, these social companies they have a vested interest in making it public. You know, they need to mine your data. They're selling your demographics and your marketing material for someone. The kind of analogy in this space is, if you're not paying for a product, are you the product? So create circles for your friends. Um, be cautious, be diligent, try not to make everything public. Another analogy I'll make is, end user license agreements change. They're going to tell you what they can do with your data, and they're going to bury it in a 50-page click-through. And they can choose to change that, and they just send you a quick email. But you're not a lawyer. It's very much in legalese. You need to be cautious of what you're doing. They may own your pictures. They may own your intellectual property. You know, just exercise diligence. Another example, Library of Congress is archiving every single tweet known to man. Everything. Every 10 years, roughly, um, the body of material that's generated in that 10 years uh, accounts or, or greatly outpaces everything we've created throughout human history. Library of Congress has, has a vested interest in preserving that information uh, for posterity, for future archivists, for future researchers and historians. So everything you're putting out there is there. It'll actually make 
an immense resource at some point once people start to, to mine social engineering or social networking sites. So keep apprised of the protections available within each application. There's something I'll mention as well. There's a third party tool called uh, Privacy Fix. It can plug right into some of these social networking applications and it can check to see where you are with respect to the protections that are available and if you can choose to ratchet them up further. Um, there's tools like the Data Liberation Front from Google where you can choose to um, export or extract your data. Uh, there's things like the Internet Suicide Machine, which will log on to some of your profiles and actually delete every single attribute one at a time, untag every single association of friends in your network would have made, and it'll pursue to iteratively purge everything about you that that site would know. Um, if I can just exercise some caution there as well, there was a, a, an instance a couple of years ago in Germany where um, a citizen decided to exercise his freedom of information rights and, and ask Google, uh, Facebook to provide what information they had on record for him, even after he deleted his account. They provided him with a CD with uh, 1,250 pages of information, even though his account theoretically no longer existed. There is the concept in this space a lot that some of these entities will maintain some data about you to do with your associations and your networks. Um, they say that they can't have control over it. That's, that's a little bit of a stretch in my opinion. Um, they create these shadow accounts, these shadow personas. Just be careful. Limit what you can. At an actual device level, uh, when you're just talking about uh, you know, hardware, your, your smartphone, your, um, your tablet, your workstation, your laptop, perhaps a server that you're responsible for, You've probably heard about concepts like operation system uh, updates, application updates, antivirus. You've heard of things like firewalls, disk encryption, and backup. The one thing you should be aware of is you don't hear about those kind of protections in the mobile phone space. They're just as susceptible to the same threats. We had, I want to say, a, a million smartphones are going to be activated by the end of this month. That's vastly outpaced the within the short amount of time that they've been available, that's vastly outpaced the growth of the PC, the laptop, the workstation market. Um, but we don't have access to the same controls, and I'll talk about that shortly. So before we get to the mobile phone space, let's talk about what's available um, there that I just briefly went over. So antivirus software, here's some free choices. Um, Microsoft give away theirs, you know. Um, Sophos give away theirs for, for OS X as well. Um, patch your computer, just be aware of whatever your vendor's current patch level is and you shouldn't be a significant delta from that. There's a nice tool from a company called Secunia and Secunia will run in the background and it'll tell you if there's an update available and if you need to apply it. Uh, enable uh, automatic updates, both Apple and Microsoft will have some aspect of this, they'll alert you that there's an update available. Um, and Secunia, you know, is kind of a nice safety net to have as well, fallback mechanism at the host layer, not, not getting to smartphones yet. Uh, enable the firewall native to the operating system. There's some information about the Windows and the OS X one. Um, test your firewall. Don't just leave it there and think that it's, it's a secure mechanism. Take an active role. There's a, an application there from GRC, Steve Gibson. Wi-Fi security in this space. Um, this can also apply to the smartphone and the tablet. When you're choosing to go on the road, you need to be aware that there's different classes of wireless network. And in particular, don't, don't choose the most commonly available one. It might be low cost, but there might be a reason for that. Perhaps they're mining your data. We see this more when you're traveling internationally. There are uh, some really highly efficient cyber criminal syndicates that are able to leverage what we typically see in the nation state espionage uh, factor, where they're outright injecting themselves in the network stream. They're pulling stuff out of there. Um, they're injecting uh, uh, applications onto your workstations. It's, it's, it's the other aspect uh, that I know was mentioned in some of these security seminars, or not seminars, uh, CS50 seminars, is a tool called FireSheep. And FireSheep was a particular uh, attack in the mobile phone space where some of these uh, social networking applications were sending credentials in plain text. And this was quite commonly accepted because everybody at the time was thinking that uh, there was no appetite in the consumer space for it, that uh, to, to use higher strength encryption implied a performance burden on the server. So 
So that if they didn't have to do it, they didn't want to. And then all of a sudden, when this uh, security researcher made the attack trivial, very quickly, you, you know, we started to see that kind of improvement that everybody in the security space had been complaining about for, for a significant length of time. So in particular, Firesheep was able to retrieve uh, Facebook, Twitter credentials from the Wi-Fi stream uh, because it was in plain text and, and they were able to inject. Again, if you're going to use Wi-Fi, choose to use one that, that's sufficiently protected, WPA2 if you can. Um, if you have to use unencrypted Wi-Fi, and in particular I'm talking to anybody that's using the Harvard University wireless, you may want to think about using VPN. I highly encourage it. Uh, other factors you may want to think about is if you don't trust the Wi-Fi that you're on, you may want to limit use. Don't do any e-commerce, don't do any banking, don't access your university credentials. Um, there's a major win in this space if somebody does steal your credentials, you know, do, do they have your mobile phone? So, you know, that's, that's another factor that they can't necessarily uh, hijack or it just makes their attack more complicated. Encrypt your hard disk. We're at an era right now. Encryption used to be a big deal 10 years ago. It was a significant performance impact. It's no longer. In fact, most of the mobile phones and uh, that kind of stuff, they're doing it in hardware and you don't even know it. The performance is so negligible. Uh, if you are talking about a workstation, we're talking about BitLocker, we're talking about FileVault. Enable it, take the time now. In the Linux space, obviously TrueCrypt can work across both of those. You may want to think about in the Linux space, there's DMCrypt, there's LuxCrypt, there's a bunch of other options, also TrueCrypt. Um, other quick way to protect yourself at the workstation level, back up your hard disk. And one slight wrinkle here, it's not sufficient to use one of these cloud synchronization providers, so Dropbox or G Drive or something else. That's not a backup solution. If somebody deletes something on one of these devices because they inserted themselves somehow, it's going, that deletion gets replicated across your entire persona. That's not a backup. That's just a propagation mechanism. So it's good to have a backup solution. There's some suggestions here for some people. Some of them are free. It's capacity-based. Two gigs of backup, you can do it. Uh, you're, if you're using University Gmail, uh, University Google at College & Co, um, G Drive, if it isn't uh, already, it will be available soon. It's a good replacement. But also look at these things like uh, Mosey Home. It's good to have a, uh, two solutions. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. If you're disposing of something, or indeed if you are in the process of sending something confidential, um, some suggestions here to securely erase a device. Darks, uh, Darks Boot and Nuke. It, that's kind of more for um, the IT savvy. Um, you may want to think about just giving it to some of these commercial providers if you can. Um, encrypting email if you have to. There's some services on campus called Excelion. If you're off campus or for personal use, I'll recommend Hushmail. We see it a lot used in uh, Whistleblower. It's, it's one of the main mechanisms for WikiLeaks, as is Tor and some other equivalents. Um, now to talk about the phone level. So the problem here is there isn't that much of an appetite yet. Unfortunately, most of the smartphones and indeed tablet OSs, they're still based on some of the principles that we saw in the 1990s. They, they haven't really incorporated some of the improvements uh, that we see at the workstation level. They're not doing heat protection. They're not doing de you know, uh, layer randomization. They're not doing address protection. They're not doing execute protection, that kind of stuff. Um, but also the device itself, by de, by de facto, isn't going to have any endpoint security built into it. So we're starting to see this change. A again, most of the, the smartphone manufacturers, Android, um, Apple, and Windows, the, the appetite just wasn't there. The benchmark was BlackBerry, but BlackBerry has kind of lost its, its traction in the marketplace at this point. And Apple have really stepped in. The, about two years ago, there was a watershed moment where they started to build in a lot more enterprise-type controls. And indeed, uh, in August, they, they, they did a presentation at DEF CON, which was just unheard of. Um, so they will do the minimum controls that I described. They'll do strong password. They'll do a prompt for that password on idle. And the device, you, you forget about it. After 15 minutes, it activates. They will do encryption. And they will also do what's called remote wiping. Um, in the Android and the, the, the Windows space, these are still TBD, um, to be determined. Android has access to some applications called Prey and Lookout, and indeed some of the endpoint security tools like Kaspersky, I know, does it. I know ESET does it as well. 
they will let you send an SMS text and purge the device. Um, Windows Phone, at this point, it's primarily oriented towards corporate style, what's called Exchange. Exchange is, is a robust mail infrastructure and it can mandate some of these controls. Windows 8 just shipped uh, last week, so I can't speak to that definitively. Windows 6.5 was a great security um, device. Windows 7 Mobile was a disaster. They, they, they didn't make all these native controls mandatory across the different vendors, so you had to to um, ratify each Windows Mobile 7 phone one at a time. Android since the 3.0 space has, has had a major improvement as well. Honeycomb and um, Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, um, they will support these minimum controls and indeed they'll support some of the, the enterprise uh, control that, I, that you can do as well. In your personal account space, uh, there is a, the Google Personal Sync that you can enable if you have your own Google space as well. So what do you do when it all goes horribly wrong? And if I can, another takeaway from this, it's really when, it's not if. This is going to happen to all of us at some point. What can you do? So what you can do, and there's a slide, uh, the next slide will, will point you to some of the FTC resources for it. But at a bare minimum, place a fraud alert on your credit cards. If I can encourage you to think about when you're using a credit card in an online capacity, um, depending on the transaction you're making, debit cards, the ability to uh, claim or the, the ability to retract a fraudulent claim on a debit card is actually a much smaller window than it is on a credit card. So once you get your report on a debit card, you have only a certain time frame and it's very low to uh, notify the bank of a fraudulent transaction. Credit cards is much larger. There tends to be a limit up to about $50,000. Um, before they'll really be able to reimburse you. So that's quite a lot of money. They, they bumped it up from about thirteen or $18,000 there quite recently. So, you know, when you think about using a credit card online, can you think about using a, a, uh, a top-up card or a disposable credit card or a burner card? Um, if you do see anything, and I'll show you how you can get access shortly, close any fraudulent accounts if you're made aware of it. File a police report if you're on campus. Reach out to HUPD. Let them know. Um, think about a, an identity monitoring service. Uh, if, as part of, you do get compromised, you may have to, they may fund an identity protection service. If they don't, perhaps you should do it. Collect and keep all evidence, in particular any uh, discussions you've had with any criminal authorities, um, particularly for insurance purposes. Change all of your passwords change the answers to any security questions that can be used to reset your password, disable any pass-through identity services. So if you're reusing your Facebook account to log on to Twitter or vice versa, break that. If, you're, if the, the compromise involved your email account, check to see if, if anything's being forwarded, because otherwise they still have access to your data. And if, you're, if the theft includes your Harvard account, please notify IT help at harvard.edu. Uh, I can't state that enough. But also, in particular, if the device gets lost or stolen and it had access to university data and you, perhaps you didn't have some of these protections, irrespective, please let us know. HUPD and IT help at Harvard. So, the link that I just mentioned that goes into that with more detail ftc.gov slash identity theft. Um, the Postal Service also has some. Uh, fraud or, or identity protection services, you, you just put a hold or stop on credit cards going through or stuff like that. Um, the FBI have a link as well, it's in the notes of the slides that I sent out. And indeed Massachusetts uh, uh, Better Business Bureau and, and Consumer Protection Bureau has some guidance as well, it's in the notes. Um, take the time now, make yourself aware of what you can do and, and take the action. The, the principal as I'd mentioned earlier, is if you don't have a plan for your identity, your identity being stolen, you're immediately going to be subject to a lot of work when it does happen, and it is when. But even when you take these precautions, let me just add a, a slight word of, of caution. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. So even at that, we still think that there can be 
some subversion. You know, you, your bank, for instance, who you've built all these protections around, they may get compromised, these trusted parties that you've given your data to. So you are your own best defense. You know, remain vigilant, remain alert. Take the time now to choose to opt into these. Hopefully socialize this, talk to this with your, with your friends. Pick good passwords, use unique passwords for your accounts. Um, don't reuse passwords in particular around some of your more sensitive assets. Don't use your university account elsewhere. Don't use your credit card account elsewhere. Password protect your mobile devo device right now. And by mobile device, I mean smartphone. Um, I mean your tablet. Think about using good security reset questions, and I'll talk about this shortly, why. Check your credit report. Another way that you can be a good citizen in this space is uh, the, the government forced the three agencies, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, to release credit reports. Um, for some of the Harvard community, especially in the student space, this might be new to them, but you're allowed to poll those agencies uh, at least once a year. Good caution, go on to that site, it's available on the FTC one, and do it every four months instead, and you're able to keep tabs on who's uh, soliciting requests for your credit card information, or if indeed if anybody opens any, any fraudulent accounts. And, and in general, the guidance is, is to be aware. And I'm going to give you a specific example shortly, but that's essentially the, the meat and potatoes of the discussion. So why this is important right now is, is during the summer, there was a gentleman called Matt Honan. And Matt, if you're out there, thank you very much for being so forthcoming with your information. But um, what happened with Matt is he worked for Wired magazine, and some cyber hacktivists went after his Twitter account. And they used some of these resources, some of this public persona that he'd made um, available, and they built a map. They, they, they knew where to attack and when. So from that, they started to slice and dice the information that he'd made available, and they found out that he had a Gmail account. So he was using a less than wise password for his Gmail, and he didn't have any multi-factor authentication on it. So they compromised his Gmail. Once they had access to his Gmail, they saw all these other accounts that he plugged into his Gmail, and indeed they had access to his whole entire Gmail or, or Google persona. And in particular, they, they started to notice that he had an Amazon account because there were some uh, 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 emails being reported to him. So then they got onto his Amazon, and they got onto his Amazon by just resetting his password because it went to his Gmail. He didn't have, he kind of had a a domino effect or credential chaining going on here where once they got his Gmail, they had the, kings to the, the keys to the kingdom. So once they got onto his Amazon, and this was through no fault of these other guys, this was, you know, Matt hadn't chosen to opt into these more secure mechanisms that all of these people had made available, um, all of these internet sources. So once they got onto his Amazon, they had access, it didn't, didn't show them his credit card, but they showed them the last four digits just so he knew what it was. They sh it showed them his shipping address. It showed them some other information that he'd done, some orders. And then from that, they decided to attack his Apple account. And they social engineered the Apple Help Desk. Apple Help shouldn't have done it, but based on this information that they were able to mine from the, the other two accounts, um, you know, the guy at the Help Desk probably thought he was being a good citizen. You know, I'm being helpful. There's, there's a, an Apple customer out there that's stranded out there on his own, and I need to help him but it wasn't the real Apple customer. So they reset his Apple account, and they sent the information to the Gmail. And once the attackers had access to his Apple account, Matt had all of his, uh, his devices tied into his iCloud, and they started issuing purge resets and wiping everything. Again, he had, he had just his data propagated. He was using iCloud as the synchronization mechanism. So when they deleted it, everything went bang. They still had an access at this point, to his Twitter account, which is what they'd tried to attack. Um, I don't know if they used Multigo or some of these other mechanisms to build out his, his internet persona, but you know, within a matter of course, they got access to four different identity services before they got to his Twitter. And it cost Mac, Matt was quite lucky he saw it happen because his kids came to him when the iPad locked itself up and it said, you know, Dad, there's something going on with the iPad. And um, he sh shut everything down because he noticed it was happening everywhere. And he started calling Apple to see what the hell had just happened. And Apple genuinely thought that there was something going on, that iCloud had gone rogue, until they figured out, he actually figured out, 
that they were sending information and they started calling him the wrong name because Apple had on file information that the attacker had subverted. Okay? So that's the kind of information that we use to build this kind of best practice. We use this as part of a, a whole series of seminars throughout October, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's been made available to you guys. I'll make sure that um, I send it out in the wiki when David makes it available to me as well. But there's, there's advice and guidance in there, much more granularly than I'm able to summarize in this short amount of time I have available around uh, what's called cloudy with a chance of identity theft, picking good usernames and passwords. Is it ever not social? And the answer is no, it's, it's, it's always social, but you need to be aware of, of what that means. Um, and it's uh, taming lions and tigers and windows, which is around hardening operating systems, which is some of the information we went to today. And the last one was about have device will travel, to talk about going mobile with these kind of data sources. So um, other than that, if you have any questions, my email address is there. And if anybody in the room has any questions, please raise your hand. Other than that, I'm going to stop recording. All righty. Done. Chris? Thank you.